name is Azalina Ibene. I'm a law professor here at Schulich School of Law. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Canadian Prison Law Conference uh, on behalf of the Law School and the Canadian Prison Lawyers Association. Uh, the event tonight is both the opening of the conference uh, with a wonderful keynote panel, and it's also our um, the school's required lecture that takes place every year. Um, it's a public lecture on access to justice issues, and it is uh, a collaboration between the School of Law and the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Um, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that um, the joint event tonight, as well as the whole conference, obviously, um, this on issues related to criminal justice and prison justice is taking place on ancestral and unceded Mi'kmaq territory. I would like to let that sink in for a second. I would like us to take it with us in every session of the conference. Uh, this weekend. The criminal and prison systems are some of the systems that continue to do violence to Mi'kmaq people and to other indigenous groups in this country. And yet, we have Mi'kmaq with us today and throughout the conference in different capacities, welcoming us on the, their ancestral territory and engaging in substantive conversation about reform and how to move forward with a better system. Um, we are all here to build, to work together, and to work towards building a better, fairer system. As we do that, um, I would like us to all remember that this endeavor must start with working to ensure that this system ceases to perpetuate post-colonial harm. Over the last few decades, progress has been made um, in prison law and prison justice. This progress was. Uh, the result of the tremendous amount of work that lawyers, academics, uh, community activists have done, and many of whom are in this room today. But a lot of work still remains. It is fantastic to have all of these skilled individuals dedicated to prison justice in one city, in the same venue, at the same time. At no point in time was there a community of legal, non-legal, governmental, non-governmental actors wanting to work in prison law and to improve the system that we have. But this also places a great responsibility on us. A responsibility not only to continue the work that we have done so far, individually and in small groups, but to actually get to know each other's work, to learn about the collaboration that we can do, and to exponentially increase the collaborative work towards improving the access to justice for some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. I am hoping that this conference is a step towards that. Before I pass the mic, I would like to take a moment and acknowledge the institutions and the individuals that have helped um, bring this conference together. I would like to thank Shuri School of Law and Dean Cameron, as well as the Canadian Prison Lawyers Association, and its membership for co-sponsoring this event. I would also like to thank our other sponsors, uh, the House Law Institute and the Housing, uh, the House President's Office, Mark Knox Law, Versus Law, as well as the Nova Scotia Barrister Society for uh, helping out with this evening, and the Office of the Correctional Investigator. In terms of organizing, I would like to uh, have a shout out for uh, I don't even see all of them. The, uh, the small group of people that have been so mighty in putting together the conference, William Gibbert, Sheila Wildman, and Hannah Garson, as well as our fantastic group of volunteers uh, that have dedicated time and effort to be with us and to work tirelessly. Um, they are indeed the people that make us think that we do have a better future ahead of us. Um, and they are Megan, Alex, Fabian, Darcy, Matt, Andrew, Chris, and Desmond. Um, also, I would like to thank people who are not officially on the organizing committee, but who have been helping out with, uh, with support, with advice, and with putting together panels. Um, the president of the, at the CPLA, Mark Knox, the vice president, Jennifer Metcalf, and tomorrow, um, Jocelyn Downey, Elle Jones, terrific 
people to be able to rely on. Uh, and of course our support staff, our admin staff at Dell, they have been working way um, beyond their tasks. Elizabeth, Sam Elizabeth Sanford, uh, Tiffany Cullen, Jordi Lonsbury, Michelle Kirkwood, Crystal Gray. And of course, thank you to our guests here tonight who are helping us open this event. Uh, we are very pleased to have you and we are all looking forward to the panel. Uh, there will be a couple, just a couple more uh, people speaking before that. We will have, um, on behalf of the law school, uh, Richard Dowdy is going to address you in a couple of minutes, um, followed by uh, Mr. Frank Demos, who is the president of the Nova Scotia Research Society. Um, and then Mark Knox is going to uh, take you through a very brief uh, history of CPLA and introduce our wonderful moderator tonight. But before that, I would like to invite Elle Jones. She has been Halifax uh, Poet Laureate between 2013 and 2015. Everybody who knows her knows she is a force. Uh, she's a very strong community activist, very strong uh, prison justice fighter, and she's also the Nancy's uh, Chairs in Women's Study for uh, Mouse and Vincent. So I'm going to pass on. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Peace. Say peace back to me. Peace. Okay, I'm going to have to juggle paper and a microphone. Um, before I start doing the poem, I just want to bring readings from you. I was told to bring readings from the prison strikers. They said that they hope that you continue to do the work you do and carry forward their words and in your work as well. So they just wanted to send readings to this. They are following with open ears, they said. Um, this poem came from, I was talking to one of them and I said, I have so many poems off prison, I don't know if I have anything more to say, I, but I want to turn on my poems. He said, have you written about jury? So here we go. <laughs> one white, two white, three white jurors, four white, five white, six white jurors, ten white, eleven white, twelve white jurors, it's an all white jury again. Gerald Stanley walked out of the courtroom of free men. Shots fired through the window of an SUV. They said he was just defending his lamp. A hang fire, he said. Just a twitch of his hand. The life of Colton Bushy worth less than the alleged theft of an ATV. What was he doing was what they debated on TV. Shots to the head while he was lying there asleep until the indigenous youth was the only one found guilty. And there were comments that he deserved it in a secret Facebook group for the RCMP and a group of Saskatchewan farmers, of course, they all agreed. And the publishing companies offered him an exclusive book deal in the jury pool? Well, <laughs> the jury pool. It didn't look like me. And there are hundreds of thousands of dollars donated to his GoFundMe, oh Canada, where indigenous lives still fetch a bounty for one little, two little, three little Indians. Raymond Cormier walked into court and walked out. Killing an indigenous girl equals reasonable doubt. The only person on trial was Tina Fontaine. The Globe and Mail headline said there were drugs and booze in her veins. The police had her to stop and they waved her on through. Just like the cops asked Colton Bushy's mother if she was drunk when they delivered the news. And the jury pool? The jury pool. It didn't look like you. And while Stanley and Cormier are as free as a bird, Adam Pompey was held for four years in solitary until the time blurred. And by the time the ombudsman got to him, he was slurring his words. They said they forgot him, or what even occurred. They say that's an accident, but haven't you heard in federal prisons, indigenous women make up one third? And indigenous kids are over half of the juvenile facilities, and the majority in care were taken from their families and just take a walk through maximum security, or take a look around v and who can't afford the surety. And they walk for day have to be away into obscurity, but then they tell me white is the equivalent of purity, and since we can't be innocent, we should bow to their authority. We can't win. We can't win, not when session is in. Not with histories upon histories about savages and sin. If you all arrive to the jury, the court will begin selecting one white, two white, all white jurors. You can dress as sexy Pocahontas if you want for Halloween. And Brad Barton was acquitted of murder in the first degree, while Sidney Godou's vagina was displayed in court for all to see. John Wayne is still an icon of the silver screen. 
I'm part of a nation that's been a blockbuster since 1915. There's gated communities where black folks aren't ever seen. When they stop us on the street, they say, that's just routine. And my friend walked into court under a portrait of the queen. Oh, I tried to buy him suits while the cops showed up in jeans. And we worried he'd look guilty if he wasn't cut so clean. They couldn't show any evidence to even place him at the scene. But when it came to read the verdict, well, you all know what I mean, thanks to one white, two white, all white jury. We need cultural reports just to be seen as human beings. And the media? Well, they said from his face they just knew he couldn't feel. And now the system tells him that maybe he can appeal, but on the appeals court there's one white, two white, three white judges. We can't win. We can't win. Not when they see a black skin. And once the door locks, no one can see what happens within. They claim you can try a habeas in court, but then the institution spins. And who will believe a criminal on what they have to say? And now my friends being there on lockdown 23 hours a day. And the phone calls only come when your family can pay. And when they have you down in SEG, the phone doesn't come around at all. My other friend broke his leg, and for weeks he had to crawl. And a third we on a hunger strike, three weeks behind those walls, they spent money on more weapons, getting the guards some pepper ball. We claw our way into the halls of justice, but our voice is just too small. We can get one or two more judges, but they still write the law. A guy tried to slit his throat and they just wrapped him up in gauze. They released a woman to a bus stop in the winter and said, that's just protocol, just like Neil Stonechild and those prairie starlight tours. And there's another woman, another woman, who set herself on fire, but when you die in a prison in this province, no one has to inquire. No charge is laid for guards who watch Ashley Smith expire, but when prisoners hit the stand, it's then they call the light. And let's take a moment of silence with Joshua Evans. When they take a child to jail, you don't expect to see him next in heaven. Andrew Loke, who was shot by the police in 21 seconds. Freddie Bolaneva executed when the police said they felt threatened. Sammy a team shot on a streetcar when he'd already dropped his weapon, but if a cop guns down a black man, he never has to reckon. We can't win. We can't win. The not guilty verdict is in, because it's one white, two white, three white jurors. Four white, five white, six white jurors. Ten white, eleven white, twelve white jurors. It's an all white jury again. Thank you. So uh, Adelina introduced uh, L as a force, and uh, it's not easy to follow such a force. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Richard Devlin. I'm the Associate Dean of, the, of Research at the Law School, and uh, I'm, I, you've got a jam-packed program this evening. I'm going to make three very brief comments and then get out of the way for the panel on Frank the Monk. Uh, the, the first point that I want to uh, share with you is that uh, Dean Camille Cameron sends her apologies. She's very, she was very keen on attending this conference and has been very supportive from the first day that Adelina walked into her office and suggested that this should happen. We've had a few issues happening in the law school in the last week and they've taken up the Dean's attention and so she does send her apologies and really regrets not being here. The second key point I want to make is that uh, for about the last 15 years, I, along with, for, for, uh, with Professor Downey, have been responsible for much of the organization of the teaching of ethics and professionalism at the law school. And central to that uh, relationship has been um, our engagement with the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, and in particular the development of the Wickwire Lecture Program. This has been a great partnership for almost three decades, which is a remarkable amount of time. And it's not that the law school and the Bar Society get on well all the time, but this has been a great partnership between us and we, we, we're really appreciative of their support. And in particular, it has put Dalhousie as one of the landmark institutions in Canada among law schools in promoting ethics and professionalism. So I really want to thank the Nova Scotia Bar Society for their support. The third thing I want to do is to, on behalf of the university, and in particular on behalf of the law school, to thank Professor Ifteni 
for organizing this conference. It's truly remarkable that someone who's only in their second year of law teaching could put the time and energy into organizing a conference of this nature and having it sold out of 200 people. Uh, we at Dahl are delighted that Adelina has decided to join us and that we're able to call her one of our own. So before we start, I'd like everyone to run the ball. Frank DeMont, President of the Nova Scotia Bar Society. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I said to Richard, I'm glad it's him going after L, not me. Uh, honorable judges, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, friends. My role tonight is to remind those of you who knew Mr. Wickwire and to shed a bit of light for those of you who didn't about him and who he was and why we are here tonight in his honor and memory. This is the 28th F.B. Wickwire Memorial Lecture in Professional Responsibility and Legal Ethics. I didn't know Ted Wickwire. I met him once briefly at his firm in 1990, but I knew of him. I met him, in quotes, on June 1st, 1990, when I was given my copy of Legal Ethics and Professional Conduct, more affectionately known at the Barrister Society as the Handbook. When told I would be called upon to make these remarks, I pulled out my dog-eared, highlighted, sticky-noted copy of the handbook. It is well-worn. It brings back many memories. I also reviewed a series of newspaper articles and transcribed speeches about Mr. Wickwire. From those materials, I think it fair to say he would have said, Frank, call me Ted, so I will take that liberty tonight. What I discovered was in keeping with what my impression had been all along that he was an ethical person, dedicated to the law, fair, decent, and kind. He was a true leader. He was a true leader in good times and difficult times. His presidency took place at the time of the uh, Marshall Inquiry Report. The clippings allowed me to go a bit deeper into his character and legacy. Some of you may know that he was the quarterback of, Dal of the Dalhousie Tigers football team for several years. He was named Dalhousie's Male Athlete of the Year two years in a row. There was some debate about the success of the team in those years. Some recalled the team playing to great success led by Teddy Wickwire. Others seemed to recall him being a leader around which a, a collapsing team tried to soldier on. The view, of both groups, the, the view both groups held in common was Ted's extraordinary leadership. It was this leadership he brought to the law leading in particular on access to legal services with his work in the formation and early years of the Nova Scotia Legal Aid Commission. And also in respect to legal ethics and professional responsibility, I mentioned the handbook. He was the handbook project committee chair. He was also the society's legal ethics committee chair. Today, as we would expect, the handbook has been replaced with an online code of professional conduct. Many of the words and format have changed but the underlying principles of professionalism remain. Integrity, competence, honesty and candor, resolute and honorable representation of clients, and duties to other lawyers, duties to the public, duties to the profession, and our duty to uphold and improve the administration of justice. My reading of, Ted's, my reading of Ted demonstrated that he lived those rules in his professional and personal life, including his duty to family and community. On the opening day of law school this year, I was honored to speak to the incoming class. The topic was how to develop a professional identity. Had I known more about Mr. Frederick B. Wickwire QC at the time, I would have simply read a few of the tributes to him as a leader in the profession, the community, and his family. He was a model of professional identity. As president of the society now, and to those coming along behind me, I think, about, I think reading about Ted gives one a sense that late in the game, Ted, the quarterback is calling a play. From his perspective, it might have been a Hail Mary pass. Throw it deep, say a few Hail Marys, and hope that someone will catch it. From my perspective, it looks like a well-executed long bomb. He knew we would be open in the end zone, looking for the pass. His pass is that my generation and the next generations learn from his example as he learned from those before him that we keep the rich and worthwhile traditions of the profession alive and honored, that we build and maintain high ethics, that we adapt and apply those traditions, principles, and ethics as necessary and apply them to our modern problems. 
that we continue to strive to increase access to legal services, and that we pass on those traditions and ethics to those that will follow us. And finally, that we solve a few problems along the way. To Ted and his generation, we owe this duty. For me, it was a privilege to learn about Mr. Wickwire, and for that, I thank you for this invitation. Thank you very much, Frank, and distinguished guests uh, as well. Um, I'm here to uh, talk about the history of the uh, CPLA, that's the Canadian Prison Law Association. And I've been part of this since 1997. And even though that goes back a fair amount, Adeline and I and Jennifer and others had to uh, go back to the uh, archives to learn about the, uh, the group in order to share some of its history with you today. And in order to do that, we had to go to some seasoned, uh, longtime veterans of the, uh, of the group. Uh, those founding persons include persons in attendance here today. I probably won't be able to spot them all, but uh, John Conroy QC is here. Chip O'Connor, counsel in the Sauvay case in the Supreme Court of Canada concerning voting rights. And also counsel, uh, once again, in Ottawa on Ippoli. Les Morley, a past CPLA president, is here. And Michael Jackson QC, of course, is here, and he'll be honored tomorrow night with a Lifetime Achievement Award at our reception. Founding members that are not here include uh, Steve Feinberg from Quebec. And this is a quote from Steve, one of the two creators, creators of prison law in Canada, Ms. Sasha Paulia, also from, from BC. Uh, hopefully you're asking, how did the conference come about and what is the CPLA? I'll answer the, I'll answer the second question first. And I'll use Steve Feinberg's notes that he sent to Adelina and I regarding the history of the organization. Uh, quote, the initial inspiration for this type of organization was in 1984 when Sasha and Quebec practitioner Nicole Dagneau, unfortunately now deceased, first called upon their colleagues across the country to come together and they wrote a seminal letter that read, quote, it is time for the disparate and isolated pockets of people working in the area of prison law to get together and discuss, discuss strategy. I'd like to add one more thing that Mr. Bibas Vaze, who's here presenting this weekend, mentioned previously in a similar forum. And what he said was this, he said, prison law practice can be a very lonely forum, and colleagues in the same arena can therefore be extremely helpful. Um, our mission statement for CPLA, I'll summarize it, but here's what it says. Um, it's for lawyers who work on behalf of prisoners, seek to protect and promote the constitutional rights, interests, and privileges of prisoners by advocating on their behalf within the community and in their dealings with prison and release authorities, by generating and sharing legal information, and by promoting adherence to the rule of law within the prison law environment, in accordance with the highest standards of justice and fairness as required by and consistent with the Canadian Constitution and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The CPLA can be seen in three ways. And this is all Steve's work. If Steve was here, he'd, be, he'd have you laughing. He's such a humorous guy. I can't do that, but I'll, 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 read what he, I'll, read, I'll read what he wrote. It can be seen, number one, as a celebration of prison lawyers, activists, and academics who built and inhabit the prisoners' rights movement. The early heroes, these are additional heroes, the early heroes and pioneers of the movement showed the federal court that there's more litigation than taxation, bankruptcy, banking, and maritime legislation. That's Steve's quote. And Steve pointed out, appropriately, that law schools, and in particular prison law clinics, are part of this development. And he mentioned that Professor Ron Price, a pioneer, 
who created the Correctional Law Clinic at Queens, where the Honorable Justice Cromwell attended, are to be given kudos. And Paul Quick, currently with the Criminal Law, pardon me, Correctional Law Clinic at Queens is here today, and he, he echoed that. <coughs> Secondly, the CPA is known for its 33-year history, including a tradition of periodic national conferences, teaching occasions, helping to organize and marshal the nation's progressive prison resources to strengthen their impact on large and well-funded adversaries. We've had conferences beginning in February of 85, chaired by Fergus, he goes by Chip, I didn't even know your first name, Chip, uh, <laughs> Fergus O'Connor. Secondly, May 91 in Kingston, July 94 in Montreal with the Quebec Provincial Prison Law Group, AAADCQ. June 97, Ottawa, October 03, Vancouver, in conjunction with the West Coast Prison Justice Society. Finally, May 05 in Kingston with the Ontario Prison Lawyers Association. Uh, thirdly, the CPLA has learned and benefited from many other groups, similar groups, including the West Coast Prison Justice Society, <coughs> BC's Prison Legal Services, and the Ontario Prison Law Association, which merged with CPLA in 2009. Thanks to Sasha's contributions, the CPLA was able and active in distributing prison law cases to the country's practitioners. We have an important uh, caveat uh, to mention, a goal of our group. Part of our current discussion being a national group is we have to better recognize our Quebec friends and colleagues, such as the AAADCQ, which has been an extremely important part of prison law development. Quebec has a third of the federal inmates in Canada, and we have to do a better job to uh, encourage association with our Quebec colleague. The last point about CPLA is the first point that I brought up today, and that's how did this come about? And uh, Richard Devlin, I think, explained that. That's Adeline. Where did she go? She's here. So she's already got a huge round of commendation, but it's all about her. So we have to thank Adelina for making this such a, such a success. Before I sit down, I want to introduce the moderator of the keynote panel. Uh, to my left, the Honorable Justice Michael McDonald. He'll, he'll moderate the panel. His assistant sent me some information about him, his bio, so I'll, I'll try to go through it quickly. The Honorable Michael McDonald is the Chief Justice of our province, born and raised in Whitney Pier, Nova Scotia. Received his BA from Mount Allison in 76, LLB from Dow in 79. Practiced as an associate and partner with Boudreaux, Beaton, and LaFosse from 79 to 90, and a partner with Stuart McKelvey, Sterling Scales from 90 to 1995. In April 1995, he was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia. In June 98, appointed associate chief justice, and in December of 04, became our 22nd Chief Justice in Nova Scotia. He's been a member of the Canadian Judicial Council for the past 19 years, chairing several of its committees, and presently chairing the Council's Judicial Conduct Committee. Most recently, he has assumed the chair with the Nova Scotia Minister of Justice of the newly created Provincial Access to Justice Coordinating Committee. We're very fortunate to have his Lordship here and as many of you know, Chief Justice McDonald will be retiring soon. And as you all know, he will be missed by barristers, academics, and the community. And so the CPLA, your Lordship, would like to present you with a token of gratitude. This is a book by Ray Hinton, a death row inmate in Alabama for about 30 years, who was freed by a champion attorney, Brian Stevenson, in the US. USA. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Mark. And to get the gift before I performed is uh, <laughs> is great. Um, and I'm going to keep it so you don't. Uh, Trying to get it back. Uh, no, thank you very much. I cherish that, and I very much, uh, I'll, I'll read that with interest, and very much appreciate your kind remarks. I am indeed uh, honored and want to congratulate the organizers uh, for this very important uh, conference taking, back, uh, taking place over the next few days. Um, 
It's an uh, honor for me to participate uh, in it, uh, particularly since it's also in the memory of uh, Ted Wickwire, as has been mentioned. Um, we have, uh, I think, an amazing opening panel to set the stage in a broader context uh, to, so that we can uh, appreciate and learn more about the challenges in our prison system. As a judge, it's particularly humbling for me to learn more about the real, on-the-ground consequences of our decisions. And, as I said, what a power panel we have um, to set the stage broadly under the title Past and Future Developments in Imprisonment and Access to Justice for Prisoners. And we are indeed fortunate to have uh, such an amazing um, level of expertise on this panel. I'm going to keep introductions uh, to a minimum so as to preserve as much time as possible uh, for the respective presentations. There will be six of them. We expect each will be approximately 15 minutes and that should leave, if my math is correct and we're, I think we're relatively on time, that should leave approximately 30 minutes or so for questions, which please keep in mind as, as you hear the various uh, speakers, uh, because we will be hopefully calling for questions at the end. The first speaker will be my colleague um, in the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, Justice Ann Derrick, um, formerly of the Provincial Court of Nova Scotia, and before becoming a judge, she was a nationally recognized social justice lawyer. Perhaps uh, Justice Derrick's most important legacy to date has been her work with the fatal inquiry into the death of Howard Hyde. Her report is arguably the most significant Canadian work on the intersection of mental illness and our present system. Justice Derrick will speak broadly about the rule of law and the importance of the rule of law in the prison context. We will next hear from Dr. Ivan Zinger, lawyer who also holds a PhD in psychology on criminal conduct. He's presently the Correctional Investigator of Canada. Dr. Zinger will provide a profile of the federal prison system and highlight key trends and concerns. Third, we will have the Honorable Thomas Cromwell, my former colleague on the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, formerly, as you know, from the Supreme Court of Canada, as chair of the Access, um, uh, sorry, Action, Com Action Committee on Access to Justice and Civil and Family Matters. He is, I would say, Canada's most recognizable champion for access to justice for all Canadians, including prisoners. He is presently senior counsel at the law firm Warden Ladner Gervais. Mr. Cromwell will talk about setting up the Queen's Prison Law Clinic as the first of its kind in the country and the significance of such a model for access to justice and the experience it provided to law students. Next, we will have Dr. Pam Palmeter, a Mi'kmaq lawyer, author, social justice advocate from the Eel River Bar uh, First Nation in New Brunswick. She also holds master's and doctorate degrees in specializing in Indigenous law. She is currently chair of the Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University and is often called as a legal expert before parliamentary and United Nations committees. Dr. Palmeter will address issues related to the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in prisons and the repercussions on individuals and communities. We are honored to have and welcome Ms. Debbie Kilroy next. She is the first and only prisoner to be admitted to as a legal practitioner in Australia. Um, she is a powerful advocate for women prisoners. She founded it as, and is presently Chief Executive Officer of the advocacy organization uh, Sisters Inside and teaches prison law at Griffith University. Ms. Kilroy will address issues related to women and incarceration. Finally, we will have uh, Senator Kim Pate, uh, known to many of you, was appointed to the Canadian Senate in 2016. She is nationally renowned as an advocate, dedicating most of her life advocating for those involved in Canada's legal and penal systems. Her passion is helping marginalized, victimized, criminalized, and institutionalized people. Senator Pate will address aspects of what prison lawyers should and need to know to promote and defend human rights, including lessons from recent cases. 
And that's just a smattering of the talent that's uh, before us this evening. So now you know why I am excited and honored to be part of this panel. And as promised, I will call upon Justice Derek first. Good evening. Um, I just want to thank the organizers very much for um, inviting me to participate in this auspicious conference. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Chief Justice McDonald for his very generous and kind introduction. I'm very honored to be here. There are some real heavyweights um, in the prison justice movement here, and it's certainly very humbling to be in their company. I, I do want to say, to borrow a term that's used in the writing trade, that I've had to kill a lot of darlings to shoehorn the rule of law into uh, 15 minutes. Um, this is the rule of law on amphetamines. <laughs> um, I was going to use a PowerPoint. Um, I will provide it to uh, Adelina for the uh, website, but I'm actually not going to put it up. I'm just going to talk. Um, the broad principles for the rule of law, it's a principle of governance. Um, all persons, institutions, entities, public and private, are accountable. So that's the principle that no one is above the law. Accountability under laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated and consistent with international norms of human rights and international uh, human rights standards. Now, where do we find it? We find it in international instruments, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We find it in the Mandela Rules. That's the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, which was adopted unanimously by the UN General Assembly in December 2015. There are 122 rules. Rule number one is all prisoners shall be treated with respect due to their inherent dignity and value as human beings. Domestic sources include the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, and interestingly, the Nova Scotia Corrections Act. And I want to thank Sebastian Ennis, who's one of the clerks with the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, for ferreting that out for me. The rule of law is explicitly mentioned in the Nova Scotia Corrections Act, and that makes it unique in the country. There's no other province whose legislation um, explicitly references the rule of law. In 2018, the International Commission of Jurists described the rule of law as a principle that elevates democracy from mob rule and is necessary to harness the energy of democracy and give it a direction and pro a progression towards the promotion and protection of human rights. Justice Albie Sachs, the iconic jurist formerly of the, no of the South African <coughs> Constitutional Court, described the rule of law as occupying a distinctive hallowed space from which powerfully attractive energies radiate. He described the constituent elements as fairness, justice, participation, transparency, and openness. We must insist that the rule of law be robust, and it must prevail no matter what. And the um, Ontario Court of Appeal in the United States and Carter said the following in 2011, the rule of law must prevail even in the face of the dreadful threat of terrorism. We must adhere to our democratic and legal values, for if we do not, in the longer term, the enemies of democracy and the rule of law will have succeeded. They will have demonstrated that our faith in our legal order is unable to withstand their threats. In the prison context, the McGuigan Report in 1976 spoke explicitly about the rule of law. That was an all-party House of Commons committee that was tasked with conducting a major inquiry into the federal penitentiary system. And it was highly critical of the federal penitentiary system and identified that the rule of law and the constituent elements of justice must prevail in Canadian, inside Canadian prisons. In 1980, the Supreme Court of Canada in Martineau and Matsqui Institution, in the context of considering the issue of whether an internal discipline board was governed by a duty of fairness, said the rule of law must run within penitentiary walls. The Sove case that um, Mr. Knox mentioned, Sove in Canada, uh, which is the prisoner voting case, the Supreme Court of Canada said, the right of the state to punish and the obligation of the criminal to accept punishment are tied to society's acceptance of the criminal 
as a person with rights and responsibilities. The court also said the charter rights are not a matter of privilege or merit. It was in Sove that Chief Justice McLaughlin coined the phrase um, describing prisoners as citizen lawbreakers, which is a, a very robust term that uh, expresses that prisoners are rights-bearing persons. She said the denial of prisoners' rights sends the unacceptable message that democratic values are less important than punitive measures ostensibly designed to promote order. In 2005, in May and Ferndale Institution, the Supreme Court of Canada linked the importance of access to justice to the rule of law. <clears throat> in discussing concurrent jurisdiction for habeas corpus, uh, that being <clears throat> the jurisdiction of provincial Supreme Courts and the federal court to entertain habeas corpus applications, the court said that that concurrent jurisdiction affords prisoners meaningful and significant access to justice in order to protect their liberty rights. The court also said that timely judicial oversight is still necessary to safeguard the human rights and civil liberties of prisoners and to ensure that the rule of law applies within penitentiary walls. <clears throat> in 1996, Justice Arbor in the Arbor Inquiry had also talked about parliamentary and judicial oversight when she said that she had little hope that the rule of law would implant itself within, within the correctional culture without the assistance and control from Parliament and the courts. In 2010 and 2011, in the Correctional Investigator's Report, the uh, Correctional Investigator said, and I'll, I'll read this passage, it bears reminding that offenders have identities and lives apart from their crimes. They are imprisoned as a consequence of their transgressions, not to be deprived of their humanity. The law follows offenders into prison. It does not stop at the prison gate. Uh, he went on to talk about the, con the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, recognizing that offenders retain the rights and privileges of all members of society, except those rights and privileges that are necessarily removed or restricted as a consequence of the sentence. He said, These legal, this legal principle is a fundamental expression of Canadian values. It reflects that the fact that no one among us, including those deprived of liberty, forfeits or foregoes the right to be treated equally, humanely, and with dignity. So why should we care about the rule of law? Well, it's fundamental to our democracy. It's grounded in our constitutional commitment to the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. And again, quoting from the Correctional Investigator, nowhere is it more important or necessary than in the administration of justice, particularly when it includes the loss of liberty. I'm going to hearken back now to the Marshall Inquiry as an example of where the rule of law has been compromised. And particularly, I'm simply going to mention the Royal Commission's examination of two cases involving provincial politicians that revealed a two-tiered system of justice, that the system was found to have responded differently depending on the status of the person investigated the two politicians versus Donald Marshall Jr. The Royal Commission found that unequal treatment makes the ideal of justice for all meaningless and renders the goal of complete public confidence in the system of administration of justice impossible. The Marshall Commissioners went on to say, a properly functioning criminal justice system is the bedrock on which society's acceptance of our system of law and the maintenance of order is based. They spoke about in, in essence, the rule of law being essential to the proper functioning of the criminal justice system, and noted that public confidence in the justice system can only be accomplished through the unwavering and visible application of the principles of absolute fairness and independence. The Arbor Inquiry took a very robust examination of the rule of law in the prison context. Justice Arbor found that a guilty verdict followed by a custodial sentence is not a grant of authority for the state to disregard the very values that the law, particularly criminal law, seeks to uphold and vindicate. She said the rule of law, speaking about prisons, is absent, although rules are everywhere. She said prisoners' rights must not be trivialized or dismissed as undeserved and said, when a right has been granted by law, it is no less important that such right be respected because the person entitled to it is a prisoner. 
Again, I thank Sebastian Ennis for finding this excerpt from the jail diary of Albie Sachs, which I think highlights the importance of the rule of law in prison. Uh, Justice Arbor having said that the correctional system is the least visible branch of the criminal justice system. Justice Sachs said, for most prisoners, the time spent in court is only a small portion of their period in captivity. The law as they know it is not represented by the judge or magistrate, defending counsel or prosecutor, but by the policeman and the prison warder. The courtroom is an important part of the law, one of its vital organs, but the crucial part of the system is the police station and the prison. Whatever jurisprudential theorists might say, as far as the overwhelming majority of people directly affected by the law is concerned, law is an instrument of coercion and punishment. So a few final thoughts here. Uh, one being, what about the rule of law through the lens of the citizen lawbreaker? In Sovey, the court said, denying prisoners their fundamental rights to send an educative message, which is what the government of Canada had said, don't let them vote, that'll tell them that they must respect the law, that, that sends a message about the importance of respect for the law. The Supreme Court of Canada said, that's bad pedagogy. It misrepresents the nature of our rights and obligations under the law, and it communicates a message more likely to harm than help respect for the law. I extracted from uh, Professor Michael Jackson's seminal book, Justice Behind the Walls, the following words from a prisoner who explained his larger reasons for pressing a lawsuit in which he sued for damages for, as he described it, the humiliating, degrading, illegal, and immoral treatment involved in a strip search. And this, that prisoner said the following, <clears throat> I have been encouraged to participate in a society governed by the rule of law. I have to win this by law. If I don't, there will be a tremendous feeling inside of me that this is all bullshit. I already have that feeling. I grew up with that feeling. I never did believe in the law, in the government, or in state-sponsored sanctions. Someone in authority has to say that this was wrong. I'll accept that. Internally, I'll accept that. I'm paying the price for my breaches of the law. Somebody has to build up my confidence in the system, because this is how it works in my world. You screw me like that, I put you in a trunk and sink the car. I don't want to live like that anymore, but believe me, that solved the problem before. Nobody ever screwed me around again. I have to assure myself that the law is at least as powerful, that no one will ever screw with me in that manner again. That's why it's so important. And I do want to conclude, <clears throat> I'm going to give the final word to Professor Jackson and his colleague, Grant Stewart, who wrote a stinging critique of the Harper government prison policy at the time called a flawed compass, that was in 2009. And this is what they said in that, uh, in that uh, report. Prison is the acid test of our commitment to human rights. If we can maintain our commitment in our prisons, we can do it anywhere. If not, then respect for our human dignity becomes conditional. Ultimately, the preservation of rights for all citizens depends on our preservation of the rights of those in our prisons. Thank you. So, who can do the rule of law in the prison context in 15 minutes? <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't think that was possible. Uh, congratulations to the organizers, and thank you, Ann, so much for your, uh, for your powerful uh, quotes, but more importantly, uh, Amazing overview of uh, Capsule so well. Uh, thank you. And uh, now we'll uh, hear from <coughs> Dr. Ivan Singer. Well, um, good afternoon. Uh, what a great, uh, I guess, what a great turnout. And I think for me, this is quite encouraging and exciting. Um, and for me, that means that uh, Canadian prison law is alive and well, and that's uh, uh, something to celebrate um, because that has not always been the case. Um, I'm a little, uh, there's a couple of challenges for me right now. Uh, one of the challenges is that there's an awful lot of expertise in this room, in the audience, and of course on the panel. 
so it's, uh, it's difficult for me to see how I'm going to be value added in, in this set of circumstances. And it's yet another of those moments where you know, I feel a little bit like Forrest Gump or Homer Simpson. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best, I promise. Uh, the other issue that I have is that I, brevity has never been my, uh, my strength. So uh, I, will, uh, I will look uh, carefully at uh, Alvina to stay on track. So I thought I would maybe do uh, uh, three things. I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about my office. I won't go at a great deal of length because I think many of you know the work of my office. Um, I will then uh, look at the profile of the offender population. Uh, and if we have a bit of time, I'd like to talk about uh, this notion of returning back to basics to uh, effective corrections. So let's, uh, let's start uh, with my office. Uh, so, um, the Office of the Correction Investigator is uh, basically a prison ombudsman office. Uh, it was established in 1973, uh, following some tragic events in 1971, uh, when there was a, a very deadly riot uh, at Kingston Penitentiary. Um, we are basically a, a, a true ombudsman office with all sorts of uh, powers and authorities, so we can uh, access penitentiary, access any documentation. We can even subpoena, hold uh, public hearings, although we've never done so. Uh, but great, great deal of, uh, of, of investigative powers. Uh, however, the bottom line is, just like uh, any ombudsman office, our powers are, and authorities are limited to making recommendations. So I don't have uh, binding authorities over uh, the agency subject to my uh, oversight, which is Correctional Service of Canada. So in terms of just to uh, show you a little bit about the uh, operation, uh, we are fairly busy. Uh, we have a budget now exceeding $5 million. Uh, the government was kind enough to uh, increase our budget uh, uh, in the, uh, this year. Uh, so we will be moving up to 41 um, uh, employees. We spend a lot of time in penitentiaries, anywhere between 350 to 400 days. Uh, we do and address a lot of complaints, uh, anywhere between six, uh, uh, typically around 6,000 a year. We also review all the, uh, the use of force that corrections uh, conduct, so there's a statutory requirement to document all these use of force, uh, and the services, when it does its own review, and all these reviews, uh, which may include, uh, you know, observation reports, but also uh, range videos or handheld cameras, um, et cetera, videos, we review all that. Uh, we also review about uh, close to or in excess sometime of 50 deaths a year and, uh, and also a, a fair number of serious bodily injuries, which is required by a lot of the corrections actually um, investigate as well. We spend a lot of time on the phone, as the statistics uh, shows, uh, and I'm also quite happy to report that our, there's a great deal of interest for the work of our office, and we have now 25 million kits on our website, which I think is a, uh, is a testimony to the great work of uh, the people who work uh, in my office. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, you know, we, these are brand new statistics um, uh, that we pulled out. 17% of the total inmate population uh, last fiscal year actually contacted our office and filed a complaint. Uh, so we have uh, uh, some underrepresentation with respect to uh, uh, access to our services by indigenous uh, men and women, uh, actually more, uh, I would say, men. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, women tend to access our services uh, more often as well as Canadians of African descent. Um, the types of complaints that we deal with, uh, I would tell you number one has always been health care uh, until the Harper government came, came in and then we saw conditions of confinement going uh, to number one spot and then now we're back to the, the health care being number one. Um, so uh, we also, uh, in addition to our uh, investigation of individual complaints, we look at issues systemically. 
and we've conducted many systemic investigations, uh, and I think those are a valuable contribution to, uh, to the work we do. Uh, the last two that uh, uh, we did um, this past fiscal year um, has been the uh, missed opportunity report, which dealt with uh, uh, an investigation into how uh, offender age 18 to 21 uh, are treated in federal corrections, and we identify many, many gaps uh, on that one. This was quite unique because it was done, and I think it was the first time, uh, certainly for our office, but even, I think, among uh, federal agencies of, of, uh, that are kind to mine, uh, to do this in partnership uh, with another um, uh, provincial agency, the uh, Ontario Patient, uh, I'm sorry, the Ontario Youth Advocate Office. So we did this one in partnership. Uh, the other one we did was uh, called uh, Fatal Response, which uh, uh, discussed the tragic death of uh, Matthew Hines. Uh, I'm afraid that, that, uh, uh, that in, in terms of justice, this is uh, a continuing saga and it's not yet uh, uh, fully uh, wrapped up. Uh, so let me uh, try to uh, now talk a little bit more about some of the views that uh, my office uh, are concerns about with respect to that profile of the offender population. I want to take you back to some of the, you know, if you are in, in Criminology 100, if it's the first time that you're exposed to uh, um, crime in, in society, uh, there's always this notion uh, that uh, by, um, uh, that you, the degree of civilization in society can be judged by entering its prison. Um, and uh, certainly Dostoyevsky said it, but it was repeated uh, many times after by Winston Churchill, by uh, Nelson Mandela, and so on. And the focus has always been as pay attention to how people are treated, and that gives you a good idea of, of uh, uh, some clues on, 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 on uh, societal values. Uh, I think we have to go beyond that and ask ourselves, who are the men and women that are behind bars? I think that is also very telling, and I would go even further sort of saying that we can use the profile of the uh, offender population as a barometer to gauge the success and failures of broad uh, public policies. Um, so let's, uh, let, let's look at some of those, uh, uh, those uh, that profile when you enter a Canadian penitentiary. Who will you see? Who are the individuals in there? And I can tell you they are not represented like a sample, a representative sample uh, of uh, Canadian society at large. Um, the first, uh, you know, what is striking is the prevalence of mental health issues in uh, federal corrections. Uh, three quarters of, of men meet the criteria for a mental health disorder. Uh, a third are requiring identify in terms of men identified uh, as requiring psychological or psychiatric services. For women, we are looking at 50%. Um, about uh, a third re uh, are on psychotropic drugs. It's actually 50%, almost 50% for women. Uh, the, uh, a third of we women meet the criteria for PTSD. Uh, there's a uh, very high incidence of self-injury, of suicide attempts that are off the chart. Um, so that's for, you know, in terms of looking at who ends up in prison is quite telling, I think. Uh, of course, with respect to uh, indigenous uh, people, uh, these statistics are now quite well known. To, uh, a staggering 28% uh, of um, the federal prison population is uh, indigenous when they only represent uh, about 5%, much uh, higher among uh, women, so we're looking at 40%. Um, also issues around diversity, we have uh, a normal representation of uh, uh, Canadians of African descent. Um, uh, with respect to uh, our ability to deal with issues of addiction and substance abuse in Canadian society, uh, we also have uh, some gaps here. Three quarters of the uh, inmate population have some history of substance abuse. And even more telling, 
60% uh, were intoxicated uh, at the time of their offense, uh, index offense. Uh, so when you talk about, you know, uh, deterrence or, or whether it's general deterrence or specific deterrence, we, we have to uh, question ourselves. Uh, with respect to education, uh, very low rates of uh, education. I think the, the best statistics here is that 65% who entered the system uh, upon admission uh, have um, uh, grade 8 or lower, uh, which I, I think is, again, uh, not representative of what uh, we'd like to see uh, and what we benefit. Employment, 62% um, of federally uh, sentenced men were unemployed at the time of their arrest. Um, there's issues around arm reduction. We know that the rates are much higher. Uh, corrections, to, to their credit, has actually addressed uh, hepatitis C and is continuing to do uh, massive progress there. We look, we, we, about three or four years ago, we were at 30% of the inmate population had hepatitis C, but now with, uh, uh, with uh, cures being available, that numbers have dropped dramatically. Uh, women in Canadian society, again, the fastest growing segment of the inmate population is the, uh, are women. Uh, and we have to remember that women, uh, one of the characteristics of women is that uh, most of them had been victim before, uh, and there's an incredible high rate of uh, uh, psychological, sexual, and physical abuse among that uh, segment of the inmate population. And finally, aging uh, in Canadian society. Uh, we are, uh, the inmate population is aging. We're now one in four are age 50 and over. And that trigger our office to initiate um, systemic investigation. Again, in partnership this time with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And that report should be uh, uh, made public um, before Christmas. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, it's a little too short because I want to tell you to go back to basics. The present, I, there are some handouts that uh, that I've uh, distributed, um, and maybe look at those as well. That is available on the website. So I'll leave it for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh Dr. Zinger, it's so important, I think, to have the statistical framework and to realize what's happening on the ground. And not, none of it was too surprising uh, to me, but it's still very important to have. Um, next, we'll have uh, Tom Brunel. Thank you, Chief. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, I feel like a bit of a frog because I was very involved in prison law very early in my career. It's been a couple of years. Uh, doing clinical uh, work in, in correctional law at Queen's when I was in law school and then did some uh, litigation uh, while practicing. Um, but I'll be forever grateful to that experience for many, many things, one of which is that it allowed me to claim without uh, any fear of contradiction that of all of the 80 judges of the Supreme Court of Canada up until my appointment, I had spent more time in jail than all of them. <laughs> Um, I never had a colleague contest that claim, I might think. Um, there'll be many opportunities, I'm sure, uh, in the future to honor uh, Chief Justice McDonald's contribution, but I can't let this opportunity slip by just to say a word of how important, Michael, your leadership has been here in Nova Scotia and beyond, and it was an honor to serve with you on the court. It was an unpleasant duty to overturn you once or twice. <laughs> but as we always used to say, when we got overturned by the Supreme Court, we weren't wrong, there were just more of them. <laughs> but anyway, I hope there will be many other opportunities to say more, but I, I, I do want to acknowledge your great contribution. I also just want to say a very brief word about two people who aren't here. Uh, the first, of course, being the late Ted LaCroix, and. I had the, the privilege of knowing Ted and working with him on a couple of projects. Um, when I was a young law prof uh, here at the law school at Dalhousie, uh, Ted was a leading practitioner, but also a person deeply dedicated to professional responsibility. And when we at the law school, or some of us, were trying to put together the, uh, 
package to institute a mandatory course in um, professional responsibility. Uh, Ted was a great ally and helped us organize a day-long seminar. It was in that context that I got to know him a bit. And he really was the epitome of generous service. He had a very active practice, but he also uh, always found time to help strengthen the profession in many different ways and also to serve his community. And it's wonderful that we have both the Wickler Lecture and the Wickler Field here at Dalhousie that acknowledges his contributions. I also wanted to say a brief word of appreciation about the very much alive Roman Price QC, who set up the uh, Correctional Law Project at Queen's and from which I and many others benefited uh, tremendously. Ron has now reinvented himself as a mediator, which if you'd known him in his sort of feisty prison litigation days, you might wonder how that transition happened. Um, I wondered if it involved medication. But, <laughs> In any event, Ron was a tremendous mentor and gave us as young law students a tremendous opportunity to, to uh, do things that we would never have imagined doing in, in law school. So uh, I wanted to mention him. I'd like to just set out, I've got a, a few themes that I want to talk about involving clinical training, uh, particularly in prison law and so on, but I guess I'd like to just set out uh, one idea that's one idea more than are in most of my talks. Um, and that is, let me leave you with a sentence that I hope you'll think is extremely profound. Um, that access to justice is mostly about the gap between what we know and what we do. Access to justice is mostly about the gap between what we know and what we do. I think I read that on a fortune cookie in a restaurant. <laughs> no, but seriously, I've been sort of struggling with um, the access to justice file, focusing on civil and family uh, justice for almost 10 years now. Um, many people claim it's worse than when I started, so I don't have any great pride in this. But if I've learned anything, I think it's what I've just said, that in many areas, almost all areas, we know what we should be doing. And this really came through to me as Justice Derrick spoke about the rule of law. Because we all know and honor those principles. The challenge, though, is in living up to them. That the, and I think that all of us who are concerned about access to justice need to think very hard about why that gap exists. And when we're dealing with law students, I think one of our prime responsibilities is to at least make sure they see the gap, you know, that they don't believe all the hype. The hype is important, those principles are important. Without those, we don't have a compass. But we can't be blind to the fact that, uh, I was going to call a friend myself. <laughs> the, uh, we can't be blind to the fact, though, I think, that those principles are often uh, more obvious in their recitation than in their implementation. And if there's any lesson to be learned from uh, prison law and many other areas of law is that our experience in these areas confronts us with that reality in a pretty dramatic way. Uh, I thought that the quotation that, that Justice Derrick had from the, uh, the prisoner sort of made that point quite beautifully in the sense that, you know, the weight and majesty of the law was somehow wasted uh, or not apparent mm -hmm. to that individual, uh, as one would understand. Let me say a brief word about the importance of clinical training uh, in prison law. Obviously, from a service point of view, it's a, a major area of need in there are there are many areas where access to legal services is a big challenge, but I think in the prison context, it's a, a huge challenge. From a training point of view, I think it's difficult to imagine any area of law where you're likely to be um, exposed to such an array of challenging issues, both substantive, uh, procedural, and also human. 
in terms of the depth of the human problems that one encounters in the area. Um, I think that in terms of real life experience, especially, you know, many of us, I won't speak for, for you, but certainly I grew up in a sort of middle class neighborhood in a CMHC, you know, subsidized house, uh, always had meals uh, on the table, um, wasn't beaten by my parents or, you know, I had a pretty traditional life. I also spent uh, my time before law school being a church organist and choir director, and that didn't seem to be the ideal training uh, to go into the hole at Kingston Hammond. <laughs> and I only can imagine what these poor fellows thought when they saw their, you know, 90-pound champion. Uh, and that was a long time ago, obviously. <laughs> But anyway, I think that, you know, exposure to that kind of reality, I mean, I, I grew up in Kingston, Ontario, the penitentiary capital of the world. I think somebody mentioned that there were a third of federal inmates in Quebec. The other third were in Kingston. <laughs> um, but I had no concept of what went on behind those walls. And learning about the lives of some of the people there and learning about the legal challenges that face them um, is something that every law student should have. Um, and it really confronted us at a very early stage, I think, in our legal careers with that gap um, that we learned quickly that society did not look after its own very well and that there was a huge gap between what we claimed as a society and what we were actually doing uh, inside some of those institutions. Um, so let me... Uh, just say also that, and this brings it back to the Wickwire lecture uh, that we're also involved with this evening, and that is that I think it's hard to imagine any area of law that engages more uh, difficult ethical issues than prison law. Uh, we, I can remember vividly, going into Millhaven uh, Institution, Maximum Security Institution, just outside Kingston, and was a little distressed to see in the interview room a sign that said, conversations may be monitored, which didn't seem to me to be the perfect solution for a solicitor and client consultation. We, of course, raised hell about this, and of course, the next time we went, the sign was gone. <laughs> What, you know, you're, you're confronted every day with uh, tough ethical issues. We had the Solosky case that Rob Price was involved in. Um, and another aspect of the training, I think, is how not to become jaded. I don't know about you folks, and many of you have a great deal more experience with this than I certainly did, but in my years of working quite a bit in, in uh, prisons, I didn't meet a whole lot of guilty people. And how to not become hard, sort of hardened to the reality that you know maybe this is the one who isn't, um, and without driving yourself insane in the process. And I think that that I certainly found that challenging even in my relatively brief experience. And I think that that's a kind of training that's very good in our business to never let the skepticism uh, that can be healthy in our work, never let that skepticism get the better of us. Um, I would like to just say a couple of words about what I see as the evolution of a prison law, because I think that in a lot of ways it's gone from a more procedural conception of the role of counsel to a much more substantive in 1974 and 5 and 6, when I was doing this as a law student, um, I did say 1973, so um, that our focus was really on a lot of administrative law principles, whether you know, statutory interpretation. One of the big cases that went through during that time was a, a sentence calculation case involving retroactivity. Uh, how much remission you lost when parole was revoked and so on. It was very technical stuff. And my sense of it is now that courtesy of the Charter and general 
generally enhanced understanding of human rights norms, that the preoccupations are becoming much more substantive <coughs> in the sense of uh, things like segregation, uh, health care, and so on, viewed through a substantive human rights uh, perspective. Um, all I can say is I sure wish we had the charter when we were <laughs> trying to roll uh, some of these rocks uphill. Um, and I think the other great thing about doing prison law, at least in those days, was it taught you, you know, how to be uh, pretty able to handle defeat. Because you, you lost a lot of cases, and I, I don't think it was just us. I think we, some of the cases were tough. So to wrap up, I just would like to say a, a quick word about the importance of what I hope will be opportunities for law students to work uh, in a clinical setting uh, in prison law. Um, people in custody, I don't have to tell anyone here, are among the most marginalized in society and meeting their legal needs is obviously a pressing access to justice issue. Um, every facet of the inmate's daily life is subject to the exercise of discretionary statutory authority. You might think of it as the regulatory state on steroids. And I think it's it was uh, Justice Derrick said there were lots of rules, but maybe not so much law. Uh, prison law is just also not just about trying to address the legal needs, I think, of the, of the prisoner, but to uh, really to be a person who can shine a light on what's going on in places where many of our fellow citizens never go and want to that having that link to the outside, having those advocates on the outside, of course, is very important to shine a light on the practical impact of penal policy and the practical impact of resource allocations. And I think that for law students and the, prof the profession uh, of which they will become a part, clinical training is invaluable. Not only is it substantively challenging, but I think it leads to direct encounters with marginalized people and first-hand experience of the exercise of discretionary power, experiences that will shape that person's outlook for the rest of their lives. And I hope will provide, I think, what the Carnegie Foundation report on legal education called an important apprenticeship in law. And it's the sort of apprenticeship that I hope would lead us to develop lawyers who had that sense of service to the community, to their profession, that Ted Wickwire so powerfully exhibited. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tom, for that uh, powerful and important uh, call to action, I think, for law students and uh, law schools and uh, Barrister Society said. Now I'd like to uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Pomeroy, please, to address the audience. Quay, Dean Deluisi, Pam Pomeroy. Is this on? Yeah. Is this on now? Yeah, I don't do well with handheld mics. <laughs> Let's see. How about this? Is that better? Okay, awesome. Quay uh, Nin Deluisi Pampometer. I am so happy to be back on unceded Mi'kmaq territory and to be with all of you um, talking about prison law and prison justice and prison injustice because that's exactly what it is right now in our country. It's prison injustice. And my particular focus is going to be on. Uh, not just Indigenous peoples, but specifically Indigenous women and girls, because they suffer a very unique kind of injustice in this country that's a form of racism, sexism, and violence, all put together in every institution that they have ever been in. And I'm going to sacrifice some of my 15-minute race to really talk about the history, because history matters. It's the link to now. 
It's the only way to understand what's happening and what we need to do to change it. And, and it's important to start not with the injustice, but where Indigenous women are. Indigenous women are incredibly strong and powerful people. And that's how we have to see them first and foremost. Indigenous women held important roles in our nations. They were political strategists, they were negotiators, they were leaders. They were, in fact, formidable warriors themselves. And first and foremost, they were survivors. And that's the context from which we come. And the context that you need to understand is that colonial governments saw that and particularly targeted Indigenous women and girls for that reason. While they raped our lands, they were also raping our women. The very first police force in this country worked with Indian agents to use rations to extort <coughs> sex from our Indigenous women and girls. That's how the injustice system started in this country, and it should be no surprise that we have murdered a missing Indigenous women today, that police officers have not opened files, that they have not investigated, or that we have yet to see justice. That gets translated into today. In addition to the sexualized violence, there was also a different kind of violence, stealing our children from us and putting them in residential schools where they would be tortured and sexually abused and in effect murdered is the worst kind of violence a woman can go through. There's a reason why women who lose their children to child and family services today have higher rates of heart attack, suicide, and stroke. It is the worst violence you can commit. But it didn't stop there. It continued with the 60s scoop. It continues today. We, in fact, have more Indigenous children in care today than ever in our history, getting worse at phenomenal rates. So it should be no surprise, then, that the prison rate for Indigenous women and girls is going up. There is a critical link between those two. But while all of this is happening and was happening, Indigenous women and girls were being sterilized to stop us from rebuilding our nations. For every one they took away, they tried to make sure we couldn't repopulate our nations. At the same time, the Indian Act created a, a system of inequality where Indigenous women would be removed from their communities along with their children, not have a voice in their governing systems, and that inequality remains in the Indian Act today. And not just the Indian Act. In fact, it is, has infected all federal laws, policies, and governing systems. But when I say systems, don't misunderstand me. Because paper doesn't rape a woman. Paper doesn't put someone in prison. It's individuals. And the thing we have been most reluctant to address in this country is the racism, sexism, and violence committed by individuals against Indigenous peoples. No law or paper can do that. And that's why we're not seeing any changes and things getting worse. How does that translate? So you've got this historical context that's continued into modern days, and now we have the worst socioeconomic conditions you could possibly imagine for a very wealthy, so-called liberal, democratic, human rights-loving, multicultural-loving country. Indigenous women and girls are at the very, very bottom across every socioeconomic condition, and have been for a very long time. You may sometimes see people in university sitting alongside you or at work and say, oh, look, things are getting better. But not for the majority of people. Not for the people who are removed relocated and erased from society, like people who are imprisoned, like all of those who are incarcerated. In addition to everything you hear in the media, water crisis, housing crisis, what we don't see are all the invisible people, that almost half of all homeless people in this country are Indigenous peoples, and the majority are Indigenous women. And guess where their children end up? If you don't have a house, they end up in foster care. And where did the majority of kids in foster care go? Two-thirds of them end up in prison. They're less likely to get an education, and they're the number one target for human traffickers. 
and other people in society, judges, lawyers, social workers, teachers, police officers, and corrections officers. They all know it's not just serial killers, it's not just a few random monsters in our society. This is what Indigenous women are facing. So while the justice system tries to look at the crime and analyze the alleged crime that's been committed, they forget to look at the person and the many multiple overlapping crimes that have happened to Indigenous women and girls that have never been addressed, that they have never gotten justice and never will. Yet they sit in prison for the crime of being female, Indigenous, and a horrible reminder of what the state has done to them. That's really uncomfortable. Reconciliation in terms of prison justice is not going to be had by putting up artwork on the walls or bringing some sweet grass to prison. We want our people out of prison. So we've got history that translates into the socioeconomic conditions that translates into the overrepresentation of Indigenous women in prison. And you might think, and many people have asked, well, maybe it's culturally related. Maybe it's addictions related. What we're talking about here are not vulnerable women. We're talking about kick-ass warrior women <coughs> who have been ripped from their communities and made vulnerable. I'm a strong woman, but if you throw me in a tank full of sharks, I'm all of a sudden going to be very vulnerable. And that's what we're talking about. It's not any kind of defect with these women that are in prison. It's the positions that they were forced into and the failure of the Canadian state to protect their core basic human rights. Their rights to be free from sexualized violence, from their teachers, their priests, their social workers, their corrections officers, their lawyers. That's a massive violation of the law. But the problem is with the rule of law is that for Indigenous peoples, it's been turned on its head and has become the law of rulers. And that law has been imposed on us, especially in the prison system, with an absolute vengeance. It is hard enough at places even like the United Nations or even in society to get some kind of attention for people who are incarcerated. But it's even harder to get attention for Indigenous peoples, and harder again for Indigenous women. And so the fact that you're all here helps me in my 15-minute race to try to convince you that we need, in fact, a radical shift. Because the injustice to Indigenous women doesn't stop in court. It doesn't stop once they're imprisoned. We can talk about prison law and we can talk about prison justice, but in fact, the assaults against Indigenous women in prison have doubled. Use of force against Indigenous women have tripled. 17 times higher for Indigenous women self-injury. And that's not even including things like suicide. The uh, Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies have long called for a review of uh, the many claims by Indigenous women and girls and other women uh, of sexual assaults, sexual extortion, and sexual abuse by corrections officers themselves. You need only read any article in the media to hear that these things are starting to be exposed slowly but surely, but not in a way that we are yet outraged by it. We have police officers in Val d'Or who still wear bands in solidarity with their poor colleagues who were outed for sexually abusing Indigenous women and girls. Stand proud, police officers, stand together. Why on earth would we support that? In a society like this, we should be saying, no, we don't accept this on the streets, and we certainly don't accept it in prison. So we have this escalating crisis We've had numerous justice inquiries that have talked about this issue of racism. There's clearly racism in the justice system at all levels. Donald Marshall inquiry told us that. 
Ipperwash told us that the uh, Ontario Provincial Police were infected with racism, that the myth of one bad apple is just that, a myth, and that Indigenous peoples face this on a regular basis. But we haven't yet been able to come around to deal with dealing with racism and sexism and sexualized violence in all of these institutions and how it creates these situations. Why are women, Indigenous women in prison to begin with? Because they mortally stabbed the person who had been beating and abusing them for years. In all the ways in which Indigenous women and girls try to navigate life and protect themselves from ongoing violence, these are the reasons why they end up in prison. And what is prison to an Indigenous woman and girl? It's a death sentence. It's an absolute death sentence. And if you manage to survive, it's a life sentence. You're far less likely to get work afterwards. You're far more likely to be homeless. You're far more likely to lose your children to CFS. And we all know what that does to a woman on the inside. You can do just about anything to an Indigenous woman, but take her kids away. So we're talking about something that's incredibly, incredibly important, but it's something that we haven't quite put our minds around yet. It's still too easy for inquiries and commissions and recommendations to say, well, let's have some more cultural awareness training. Let's have some diversity training. We are not going to professional development our way out of this. Because the problem is our culture. There is nothing wrong with us. The problem is on the flip side. And if you have to go to professional development training to learn that it's wrong to rape an Indigenous child, you shouldn't be in policing, you shouldn't be in corrections to begin with. But the problem is, we don't have any transparency on how prevalent it is. We don't have any accountability in terms of what are we going to do to stop it and there's no consequences. How many police officers, you can probably put them on one hand, have ever been held accountable for the sexualized violence against Indigenous peoples or corrections officers? Because honestly, who's going to believe anyone in prison? So what I'm asking people to do is help us change this whole concept of what it means to commit a crime, how it is that we interact with people who are trying to navigate poverty, racism, and sexism. And is the answer always going to be prison? Is the answer always going to be corrections? Because what are you trying to correct? <laughs> Being born female and indigenous is not a crime. And the fact that they've managed to survive should be celebrated. I'm so thankful all of you are here today because this is such an incredibly important topic. And if you do nothing else, tweet about it. Pam underscore Palmeter on Twitter. <laughs> but seriously, this is about people caring and putting pressure on and not allowing Indigenous women and girls who have been erased and hidden in prisons to languish there. That reconciliation is far more than that. It's about real justice right now and bringing our people home. Thank you. Wow, what a powerful, moving presentation. Thank you so very much. Uh, Ms. Silver. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Thanks, Pam. Um, you said a lot what I was going to say, because <laughs> in Australia, same issue. 
country that was invaded and colonised and continues to colonise. And we see, you know, the examples of the ongoing violence that's perpetrated against Aboriginal people at home when we walk into our prison system because of the mass over-representation of Aboriginal women and girls. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I'd like to acknowledge elders present and past and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the sovereign people from the country where I reside and work. Sisters Inside has offices on Turrbal and Yagara land in Mianjin and on Bindal land um, up in North Queensland. I reside on Nulumpul land, which runs towards uh, down to Minjeraba, where my husband, who is a bachelor man, uh, resides and has ties to that um, beautiful island there. Sovereignty was never ceded in Australia, just as here in Canada. As in all invaded states, colonisation has been ongoing and continuous in Australia. Colonisation continues to have a devastating impact on our First Nations peoples, especially women and girls and children. Through stolen land, through loss of culture, loss of language, through child removal, through imprisonment, through separation from families and premature deaths. I want to thank the organisers for inviting me to present to the conference tonight and also um, I'll be on a couple of panels over the weekend. I'd like to acknowledge distinguished guests who are with us and anyone who's in the audience that has been in prison themselves or has family members in prison. I'd also like to bring to the forefront of our minds all the women and girls and men who are languishing in prison right now. And I can think of a law that we have um, in our Corrective Services Act, um, which a number of women, um, the practice will, out of that law and policy, uh, be inflicted on them very soon after having a contact visit with their children and their family. And that's our strip searching legislation. So our strip searches at home are supposed to be dignified. So that sounds nice and fancy and feels warm and fuzzy for all of us out here in the free world about a word dignity and dignified. And I can imagine that you're imagining what a dignified strip search may look like. <laughs> Maybe not. But at home, a dignified strip search is where we remove the top half of our clothing, including our bra, and give that to the prison officer. We raise our breasts, flick our hair, turn around, open our mouth. Then the bra may be given back to you. Then you take the bottom section of your clothing off, including your tampon or your pad, and hand that to the prison officer, and you may be asked to squat and cough, and even over a mirror. That's a dignified strip search. That's the practice that comes out of the law. Those of us that are lawyers or studying to be lawyers, we need to be very careful because at the end of the day, the language in a piece of legislation might sound fine and dandy and really warm and fuzzy, but when it comes to the practices of those who are supposed to be adhering to the rule of law in our prison system are actually undertaking sexual assault by the state, nothing more and nothing less. The only difference is that they won't be arrested if I did the same thing because they're prison officers. Or the extension, we could take that too, as police officers. And women will, will have to undertake those strip searches now as I stand here because they cuddled their baby, they cuddled their children, they kissed their grandmother or their two-year-old goodbye. That is what they pay the price for having to be able to touch and care for their loved ones. And I'm sure you all know the background, you know, it's been spoken about already, the histories of horrific violence that women, and particularly Aboriginal women, have experienced and before they hit the prison gates and the violence continues inside the prison walls. 
I'm the CEO of Sisters and Sci, which is an independent community organisation which exists to advocate for the collective human rights of women and girls in the criminal injustice system. And we do so alongside women and girls. So what that actually means in practice is that women, Sisters Inside was born out of when I was in prison and when I was released and I said I would come back. <clears throat> the screws, the prison officers, would say to me, yeah, you'll be back, because they thought I'd come back as a prisoner because I've been in and out of prison since I was 13. I first went in for actually wagging, truanting school. Social workers convinced my working class parents, poor parents, to have me locked up for four weeks because it would teach me a lesson. Yeah, it taught me a lesson, not the lesson that the social workers and cops thought it was going to teach. And of course, when I was criminalised, as many other girls are, the slippery slope that you're on cannot be stopped in most women's cases. <clears throat> so I did come back to the prison and it was after a period, what we call um, in the jurisdiction that I live in, Queensland, where there was a window of reform. There was a, a murder in the prison. My friend, close friend, who I knew very well, was murdered sitting beside me, closer than his honour, sitting beside me here. And um, they sacked all the prison management. And then new management came in. And so at that time, uh, the head of corrections, uh, which we call the director general, the com I think commissioner now, um, he decided to run a bit of experiment on us women because there was about 100 women in prison at that time and it was overcrowded then. And the experiment was to split us up into committees who wanted to be on committees. So we were on committees like around issues of food, of health, of family contact, children contact. Um, there was a number of committees that were established. And I was on one of those committees and we had a life as a long-termist committee. And when I came back into prison, that's the committee that I continue to work with. And those lifers and long-term women have been on the committee ever since. I'm happy to say now that all of them are released. The last one, after 23 years imprisonment, is now in the free world, however still on parole and will be till the day she dies because she's a lifer. And she's on our committee outside. But we still have our board meetings inside the prison and have other women on our management committee. And it's part of our actual constitution that a group of women in prison must be part of our management committee to drive all decisions and make all decisions for the organisation. <clears throat> so the organisation now um, as quickly has four pillows or four arms, I call it. So one is that we provide a lot of services and support to women in prison. And our service provision staff, we have over half of our staff that are engaged at Sisters Inside are Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander women. It's fundamentally important as a white organisation that Aboriginal people are employed to provide those sort of services to work with and for, for Aboriginal women and Torres Strait Islander women in our prisons. We um, do a lot of law reform and advocacy. So we present to parliamentary committees, um, meet with ministers regularly. Um, we're out on the streets as activists because we're a prison abolitionist organisation. And so we talk about imagining abolition and how we're going to get there. I don't want to talk about reform. I'm sorry. I know other people um, may want to talk about that. But reform is just a net widening mechanism for more carceral structures. And we see that now in the US. For example, everybody, and Canada included, are now turning to electric monitoring that you put around your ankles. Or home detention type of um, carceral structures. That actually just net winds. It means every house can be a prison, and it means every person can be imprisoned by having an electronic monitor around their ankle. So we don't want to talk about reform. It's time for reformists to be reformed and become prison abolitionists and how we get there. <laughs> we also do a lot of community um, education, so we've developed our own frameworks, how we work with and for marginalised, racialised, criminalised, disadvantaged women and girls. And, the, and some of those frameworks come out of a human rights framework 
We don't have human rights legislation in our country. Um, we don't have a charter. Um, our government at the moment of the day, a left-wing Labor government, is talking about now um, drafting up human rights legislation, so we hope that that may be enacted next year. But on that note, we don't want a human rights act if it's skeleton and it has no meat on it and it actually means nothing for women and girls and men in prison. So it's, we go back again to the word a dignified strip search. People get excited about human rights legislation, but if it's, there's no meat on the bones, it actually means nothing. It's just a marketing model for those in power to say that we are looking after people's human rights that are in the prison system. And they are the most voiceless, the most powerless than anybody else because they are disappeared from us in our communities behind razor wire or concrete walls. <coughs> and as um, His Honour said before, I'm also now a lawyer, so I have a law firm that's attached to Sisters Inside. So we represent a lot of the women and girls um, who are criminalised and charged with criminal offences and support them, advocate for them in the courts. We undertake a number of decarceration strategies, which is about working towards abolition. So we work very hard in keeping women and girls out of prison in the first instance. That's where we've got to filter the money to, not to prison. As Kim would say, the more money spent on prison, the less money spent on community. And it's time, instead of allowing governments to eviscerate social services continually, but pouring billions down the throat of a prison industry, that that money must come back to all of us in the community, particularly the most marginalised and disadvantaged Indigenous peoples of our country. I wanted to talk a bit about, um, I'm not sure if people know, but we know globally at least just under 800,000 women are in prison around the world and girls, which is a horrific number. And it will get to a million in the next couple of years. And that's on any one day. That's not over a year. That's on any one day in our world. And the number of women and girls in prison worldwide has increased by around 53% since the year 2000. So women and girls, and particularly Aboriginal women and girls, are now the target of the prison industry, the prison industrial complex. The arm of that are the police. They're catching up, they're criminalising Aboriginal women. And what we're seeing at home, and I imagine it'll be the same here, and I'm sure Kim or Pam could um, um, let me know if it's accurate, but what we're seeing now is the police are actually targeting Aboriginal girls more so than anybody else. And their numbers are increasing at a great rate being pipelined into the youth prisons. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women at home are 16 times more likely to be in prison and 74% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have been in prison before. So we're talking about a system that's a fundamental failure. If Dalhousie Law School had a 74% failure rate where students just didn't come here anymore, they would freak out, yeah? <laughs> they would call board meetings, they'd be calling the judges that, used to, that did their law degree here. They would be calling every resource possible and saying, what have we done, what have we done, we've got to do something different because it's not working, because we have a 74% failure rate. But when it comes to prison and we have a 74% failure rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, what do we do? Nothing. Well, we allow and endorse our governments to continue to pour millions of dollars down the throat of a prison industry that's a fundamental failure. Why do you, why do we as taxpayers allow this to continue? Because it's an industry and you're actually part of the industry and you will make your paycheck on the backs of women and particularly black women who are in our prison system. And I want you to think about that. That's why we as an organisation are a prison abolitionist organisation. So we work towards ending imprisonment. So we all live in a world of freedom, each and every one of us. 
we need to smash, oh, one minute. <laughs> the capitalist world, because that's the world we're living in. Very individualistic, it's driven by racism, go and have a look in a prison, and it's driven by the value of property and money. It's not driven for the value of people and the value of the most marginalised women and girls in our community. I have to end there. I had lots more to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have another extremely powerful and thought-provoking and, for me, humbling presentation. Senator Pate. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to everybody here, and um, I want to also start by acknowledging the traditional territory on which we have the privilege of being, and to, for the Mi'kmaq people for being the custodians of this land for many years before so many of us uninvited guests arrive. And thank in particular Pam for um, being from the, the broader territory here, and uh, for the leadership you've shown, and thank you to all of your family, your community, your elders, and your leaders. Um, I also, for all of the years that I have spent, and it's now getting, um, I'm getting older and long, you know, anyway, I am old, um, and for the more than 35, 37 years that I've had the privilege of walking in, but most importantly being able to walk out of prisons for young people, then prisons for men, now again prisons for men, and, the, and for women. It's been painfully obvious the impact of what you've just heard from, uh, from previous speakers. Painfully obvious the impact of colonization and the impact of the lack of substantive equality in this country. I want to talk a bit about what I think, and I want to, actually I want to thank all the co panelists, sorry terrible for not doing that. And anything I say um, that I'm going to be proposing, um, some of it you can hold responsible people like Justice Ann Derrick, who taught me how to be a client and how to be with clients, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And you, can, you don't have to hold Justice Cromwell, or the Honorable Thomas Cromwell, responsible, but he taught me uh, evidence and judicial remedies. And I took very creative license with what I uh, <laughs> learned from that. And I'll talk a bit about how, how I think some of these things could be being done. Um, and what tools we have available and what we could be doing quite differently. And I want to thank all of you who have um, done work in this area or will be doing work in this area. And I had the privilege last week of being with an amazing, another amazing group of young uh, people who were students in the school as we were exploring issues in criminalization and imprisonment. And I, I thank all of you for the work you do because all of you have helped me learn the things that I, I now hold true and, and believe. And so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, when I said Anne taught me how to be a client, what I meant was that she taught me that if you really are going to work well with people, they are not just props or puppets. That your client isn't just your prop or puppet. And no more, more than in the prison experience have I seen that ring far too true at times. My first visit with a woman named Gail Horry, who some of you will know, um, she, she told me something that it took me a while to learn, and then helped me learn it as well. And she said, if you come here and you just, you just take out the words and parrot them, it will be just as disrespectful as if you never came here and listened to me in the first place. And it took me a while to understand what she meant. And what she meant was, I came in with information, not all the information, but I had greater access to information than she had in the segregation cell in a men's prison where she was being held at the time. And so then I had an elder tell me, you need to learn the seven teachings and be guided by that. I thought, what does that mean? So I, I, I um, went and learned, and it is to treat people with respect, to know that they have knowledge 
have truths, have experiences that they can teach us, is to respect them by treating them as you would want to be treated. It is by being truthful when you hear something that's racist or sexist, to confront it, just as you would want to confront it, I would say should, but that's my judgment, um, confront it if you heard it from anybody else you know. To love. If you're not, if the person you're going to be working with you are incapable of caring about, you will not provide the same level of service and quality of intervention if you don't see them as someone that could be your loved one, someone you care deeply about and want to make sure is not feeling injustice. If you don't have wisdom to be able to acknowledge with that humility when you don't know what to do, when you're not sure which way to go, to say that I need to find more information and that I will share it with you when I know it. And to, above all, have with all of those, not above all, sorry, they're all equal, I'm told, I keep being told that. There's no hierarchy, Kim. So, but with all of that, to then have the courage to do something. That when you know this, you can't unknow it, but you can just ignore it. And lots of people do, never do anything. To have the courage to recognize your privilege of opportunity, of experience, of position, of resources, whatever it may be. Because no matter what, even if you've been in prison before and you're in this room, you're in a position of privilege relative to everybody else who is in prison right now. So do that. So that was really, those were really important teachings. You think, okay, that's great, Kim. Then what do you do with that? Well, what I've seen over my years as people are doing more work, work in prisons is just the opposite often. A belief that we know better than the people who are in prison. A belief that we come in with the knowledge that we can tell them how we can fix it. And it's at the root of the reform that Debbie talked about. That if we think we can change it and fix it, one, do we really have that authority and power to do that? That's not being honest, we actually don't. Do we trust that the system will fix itself? No. But how can we challenge some of those things? Well, we can use the tools available to do just what Debbie and Pam challenged us to think about, is how do we actually ensure that we use the tools we have available to try and get people, prevent people from going in or get them out. So, Justice Derrick talked about international norms, charter, that sort of thing. All of those are standards by which we hope the law will operate. So, when we talk about the Mandela Rules, or the international <coughs> minimum standards of treatment of prisoners, recognizing those are floors, not ceilings. Recognizing that they are not aspirational documents, they should not be, they are standards. And that if anything, especially in a country like Canada, we should be aspiring for far more than that. International standards are based on what is happening the world over. And if you're comparing what's happening here to what's happening in the United States or other countries that are doing things far less progressive, then you're actually diminishing the position that you're actually trying to achieve. Louise Arbour, two years ago at a conference that the Elizabeth Fry Society held, talked about the fact that she felt no lawyer, no judge, no legislature, legislator should be actually involved in sentencing someone to prison if they do not know where they're going. And by that, she meant the conditions of confinement, how they will be treated, and what will happen to them once they're there. How many judges how many lawyers, how many senators and members of parliament do you think go in regularly to see what the conditions of confinement are? 
I know there are very few, there are increasing numbers of senators. <laughs> <laughs> but Canada can and should be a leader in this area. And we can and we should be demanding no less than that standard. So I want to talk a bit about a few cases, and not just individual cases, but a few approaches that have shown the, the fragility and the problem when we don't take that approach. So those who go into the prison regularly, and I know there are a whole bunch of people from, and they were, lots of people know I used to work with EFRI, so from the Canadian Association, once a month, at least without fail, there are a group of advocates who go into every federal penitentiary for women in this country. They go through the entire prison, including segregation, to see the conditions of confinement and to try and address the issues they see. In addition, there are women advocates in the prison, serving prisoners, who work on those issues in between and keep in touch with the teams. So why do you think that organization came to a bit position of saying we should decarcerate, we should start with things like getting rid of segregation, we should ensure that as much as possible we're doing everything we can to prevent people from going in and get them out. Why did they have a position around guaranteed livable incomes? Why did they have positions around ensuring that we have free education? Because they're all intertwined. And what they see by seeing those conditions of confinement is that every attempt to reform has led to an expansion of the type that uh, Debbie talked about of the prison system, an entrenchment, and in fact more and more, particularly women, but those who are most uh, vulnerable, particularly racialized women, those who are most marginalized I should say, racialized women, as well as those who have mental health issues, those who have experienced violence and the like. So, because of an inadequacy of the true knowledge of what's happening in the prisons, we see aberrations like the one in the segregation case in BC, where at one instance, the judge is saying segregation is bad, and there's tons of, don't hear me as saying there's not lots of good information in these cases, there is. First time that there's a recognition that segregation is bad across the board is happening. All of those things are true. But you then have a judge saying that because of his inadequate knowledge of the conditions of confinement based on what was put before him, but also his obviously his belief, we end up with a situation where he doesn't feel that women are disproportionately impacted. You just heard an abundance of evidence the correctional investigator has been documenting this for years. Why? Because nobody knew enough to know to cross-examine the corrections witnesses about all the details that were incorrect about what was being put on the record. Nobody wanted to take a position of no segregation. It couldn't be done. I heard lots of arguments about it. And I heard people say, and I was actually, I said, okay, I don't know enough. I haven't been working with men for a while. They said, men want this. Well, I'll tell you what. We're about to go on the fourth trip, the prison, the Senate Human Rights Committee into prisons, and I've yet to find a prison where when we talk about the options and I challenge them to think about other ways to deal with what they're dealing with in the prison, that they don't come up with alternatives to being segregated. And they say, well, we were some of the ones who said we need segregation for these reasons. So we do need to keep challenging, in my view, those floors and create new opportunities and make Canada the example that we could be internationally for true reform, if you want to use that word, but true emancipatory action, true substantive equality, particularly for prisoners, if we started looking at what's actually happening. Why did that judge think that? He's not a stupid man. Why did the, the people who are involved, the lawyers, the clients, put that information? Because, in fact, the work that had been being done for the better part of 20 years to reduce the numbers of people in segregation meant that there were fewer women in segregation 
over the previous period than they had been before those cases started. So of course it looks like there's been improvement. But what never got put on the record is every single prison in this country for women, and now I'm seeing for men as well, every person classified as maximum security in this country is in a state of segregation. May not be the place, because those of you who are lawyers know, segregation is both a status and a place. The place they call segregation and a status of being separated from general population and not having access to programs, services, your loved ones, visitors. And as the correctional investigator has articulated very well, we're seeing an increasingly repressive regimes throughout the prisons. When every maximum security prison for men that I've been in on this prison visit, they are starting to do the same thing that they did with women 20 years ago. All these segregated units, no mix, 21 hours, 22 hour lockup. Uh, and now it's permeating worse. Now we've got lockdowns, which I consider another state of segregation. When you've got institutions locked down for increasingly extended per periods, and nobody's allowed out of their room, their cell, their observation unit, whatever you want to call it, you're in fact creating increasingly segregated states. So one of the things that, that we're, where we can look at, in my view, is look at some of the decarceration strategies that Debbie challenged us to. Where, right now, you don't have to change the law, just have the courage to start to do this. When you have someone who comes before you and they have mental health issues, look at Section 29 of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. It allows the prison to transfer people out of the prison to health facilities, to health authorities, and they could do that. Do they do it? Sure. If they think I'm having a heart attack, or if they believe I'm having a heart attack, that I'm not just making it up to get attention, because some people die when they, they say they're having heart attacks. But if I'm having a heart attack and I go out, there's no presumption that any guard can do cardiac surgery. But there's a presumption that somehow they can triage mental health issues. So, Section 29. My time is up, so the other ones are Section 72. Every senator, every member of parliament, every judge has a right of access to our federal penitentiaries. Go get them, take them in, and tell them you want them to help you get access and do what you need to do in there. Section 77 says for women, there needs to be specific approaches and it needs to involve those doing the work. Hello. You can go talk to all that E-Fry gang up there about what you can do there. <laughs> Sections 80, 81, and 84 are specifically focused on Indigenous and everybody else. So the subsection of those of 81 and 84 says these can apply to non-Indigenous prisoners too. And they say you can take someone who's a serving prisoner and take them into the community and have them serve, serve their community there. Corrections will tell you, and I suspect you may even have a presentation here will tell you, that you have to open up a little mini prison. I call, this is being taped, I say that's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing in the legislation that says that. It's only in the policy that Corrections has developed. We have been working on, and I see Darcy's here, and Atif is not here, but some of the students who have done incredible work researching that, and we have the background material showing that the intention, not just of those provisions, of, but of the CCRA itself, was to be a piece of human rights legislation, and listen carefully, to reduce the numbers of people in prison. If that was the legislative intent, then we sure have not been doing a very good job. So sections 81, 84 can be used. 81 is for people serving prison sentences, 84 is a paroling option. Then we can do things like they did just recently in Brazil. A woman went to court and challenged, um, just, like, just like had been done in South Africa. When Nelson Mandela came into, uh, into power, in the Hugo case, he, uh, he was challenged, but he decided that every mother, and talking about what Pam Palmer talked about, every mother who was in prison who had children under the age of 12 would just be free. That's it. Did it. No increase in crime, no increase in risk to public safety. They've just done it in Brazil. And guess what? They also released everybody awaiting trial who, was on, who had children under the age. And so 
you can be doing some of these things. We can also say, if, you do, if you're more interested in legislative reform, okay, we'll challenge the new, the C-56 that is supposed to be the fix to the segregation issue. Many, many members of parliament believe it's a fix. You have to challenge that. And, and we can also say, let's do at the very least what they did with the Youth Criminal Justice Act. About 15 years ago, everybody was up in arms. Oh my God, we had this Young Offenders Act and now we're jailing eight kids at eight times the rate we're jailing adults. By the change of a policy, or a piece of legislation saying, judges have to first look at other systems, they cut in half the number of young people in custody. But newsflash, guess who didn't get cut in half? Indigenous kids, black kids, and girls. And so we can and must do better. And so I know my time is up. So I have spent the first half of my career trying to reform prisons. The second half is now about trying to prevent people from getting into prisons, being put into prisons, shoved into pri pr prisons, dying in prisons, and to get them out. And I, for one, know you're all up to the challenge, and I look forward to working with all of you to do that too. So thank you. Well, I, I uh, can we have a collective, even bigger round of applause? For you? We've got about 20 minutes, and we'll try to do this as democratically as possible. Perhaps I'll get uh, Professor Devlin to help me make sure I take the questions in order. And do we have a roving mic, or do, does someone want to take this? Or? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's a mic. Yeah. Okay. Good. So um, it's open for questions. I'm sure you must have some questions. Yes, right here. Thank you. So are we all going to ask the government to put up some money so that lawyers can keep taking the correctional system to court in order to force them to improve? Right. Comments. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I'm going to get some comments. <laughs> well, isn't the government the problem in the first place? Um, in the sense that they are legislating to ensure that the prison industry is alive and well. So I can't see that they're going to fund lawyers to get people out. They may a small amount. But I think the reality is that those of us who are lawyers, we're in a position of privilege and great honour that the majority of the community will never have that set of skills. And I think we need to use the set of skills to actually assist the most marginalised people in our prison system to get them out and to challenge corrective services and the government. And that may mean that there is no money. It's about why do we always need money to do something? I know you've got to live, you've got to live under your house, but do, do you need two cars? Do you need two properties? Do you need a flash set of high heels, a nice handbag? Or are you going to spend some time actually doing some pro bono work? to give back to the community because of the privilege that we carry for being lawyers. I'm sorry. I'm... <laughs> experience not very many so the point is you need some carrots up there to encourage them in order to do it. So one of the remedies that um, was in that Louise Arbour recommended in 1996 that I think could deal with some of this is she said that where corrections interference with a lawful sanction basically frustrates the sentence. If someone is put in segregation or they're locked up or they're not getting access to programs or 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 that they Judges should be able to revisit those sentences. And I think that's one way to get it, and in addition to civil claims that are some of which have been being brought, I think that is. The other thing is I do think, to pick up on one, one thing that I raised that I didn't expand on, is one of the things I'm exploring right now, if, you know, oh, and if anybody wants to support the bill, that'd be good too, if you want judges' <laughs> discretion. Um, but the, one of the things that we're exploring is 
guarantees of low incomes as a way to allow people. Right now, there are so many young lawyers that I that want to do this work and can't afford to. They they can't even find jobs to do it. They can't find places, particularly racialized um, young people who are graduating from law school. And if we had a guarantee of low income thing, I I can guarantee I know at least just off the top of my head 20 young people who would want to do that work and get their basic income, which would really be a huge benefit. So I think it is about thinking creatively. If I won, well, I was going to say, but I thought, you know, it's not, anyway, I was going to say, our, our plane got struck by lightning today. That was, I thought it was pretty cool. My dad just told me I'm stupid. It was not cool. <laughs> and, well, anyway, it was, I didn't know what it was. Um, but at, the, at that point, Debbie looked at me and said, maybe we should buy a lottery ticket. And I often have said, I've never bought lottery tickets since a uh, prof taught me statistics and I realized what the chance of winning was. But in all seriousness, if we, if we had a lawyer for every single prisoner, I guarantee there's every single prisoner has a lawsuit in this country. And that, more than one. Yes. More than one lawsuit. Yes. Other point, and that is the Supreme Court of Canada said in the Carter case that lawyers should be encouraged to do pro bono work, and the way that they can be paid is through substantial indemnity costs, and the courts awarding them costs for doing so. So that's something that I think needs to be looked at as ways to fund some of these issues. That's an example. I think that. Uh, if you actually look to the South, you actually get a good answer here. Uh, in the United States, at the federal level, um, if um, there's a statute that says that if, uh, uh, if there's a claim uh, against uh, a government, uh, whether it's a state government or the federal government, um, and the, uh, there's a successful challenge in terms of a civil right violation, lawyers are entitled to reasonable fees. And this is how the American Civil Liberty Association is now uh, omnipresent and taking all these uh, cases um, to court. Um, and they are now represented in over 50 states. So there is a way that you can legislate it, uh, legislate it uh, which I think is a much more um, stronger uh, position than, for example, the charter charter court challenge program, which is much more uh, you know, narrow. Uh, so I think these are the kinds of things that looking to, to our neighbors in the South could, could, uh, could resolve the issue. But nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, I have two answers to that question, and I'm, and I'm actually glad you raised it, because with regards to whether it's prison justice or justice for Indigenous peoples, the question of money always comes up. Well, what about the cost? And do we have to ask for more money? Um, and here's the thing. In Canada, there is more than enough money for literally everything. <laughs> if we can buy a Trans Mountain Pipeline, we can buy <laughs> Mountain Pipeline came out of the air. And this isn't about being pro or con pipeline. It's if we care enough about the issue, there's more than enough money to go around. But even at that, let's pretend there is this little finite pocket of money. Um, there are things that we can and should be doing. Like the cost of practicing or getting a license to be a lawyer should absolutely mandatory include that you represent prisoners that you represent people that don't have the money to do it. And not just on your honor pro bono and the cool cases that might make a law firm look good, but you don't get to practice unless you're practicing for the people. And put the social back in our justice system. Most of the lawyers I know do exactly that. But yes. they don't get paid. They, they, they have a lot of there for 20 years. They haven't had an excuse. Uh, I'm Dick Cromwell, representing Quakers Fostering Justice. I'd like to ask Senator Pate if there's any chance that the government of Canada will adopt the Mandela Rules as minimum standards for the treatment of uh, prisoners in Canada. Well, they, they say they do, and the, the reality is that's not good enough as far as I'm concerned. And just to pick up on something that uh, Pam just raised, there is no end of money and resources to do security interventions in prisons. So um, 
you know, Canute James, who's an indigenous woman who died in prison having a heart attack because they thought the mental health issues, and she was just trying to get attention. Her brother said it better than I can. He said, when she wanted to get an education, it was E. Fry and others who supported her to help her get an education. They would not give any money to support her getting an education. The minute they wanted to transfer her across the country or put her in segregation, there was no end of resources to use for us. And so it is also about saying, how do we spend that money and why do we spend it that way? And going back to using Section 77 of the CCRA for women, um, if you go back and look at what the plans were for women, it was way more than what the Mandela rules or the Bangkok rules, which apply to women, are. Um, and it was way more than that. And it's been totally frustrated by the way it's been by the way the plan has been implemented. So we, we need to, I think, go back to basic principles about what we are trying to do. And the costing that the, the parliamentary budget officer did in 2010, and then just recently again after I requested it, or our office requested it, um, is, you know, they've come out and shown. I mean, it's more cost effective to get people out of prison and invest in social services, healthcare, and education than it is to continue this practice. So I think we also need to look at another of Louise Arbor's recommendations, which was judicial oversight of some of these, and, and really to ensure that um, what's happening is exposed, and, and so that people can be paid for their work. But I think there are other ways and creative ways which we're looking at these things as well. Thank you. Present. And, and here, yes. You're on. I'm not a professor. Oh, I'm sorry. You're looking for You're now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and, I'll try and uh, portray that for him. <laughs> um, actually, I was going to ask a question from Jeff Caldwell, who I will remind you are retired, so I expect a very open answer uh, <laughs> off the cuff, speaking very uh, widely about what you think uh, judicial activists should do. Uh, I will simply say, since we're talking about uh, minority representation, I do see it, having practiced uh, prison law for 10 years, I don't think I'm, I, I think I've maybe seen one or two prison lawyers of indigenous background um, actually practicing for indigenous people in the prisons. I think that's unfortunate. I can say that I am one of the only visible minority uh, prison lawyers that I have known. Um, and I come from fairly privileged circumstances myself. So we're not doing enough to encourage the people that we say we are trying to look out to to actually be the lawyers representing those people. We need to do much more. That's number one. Uh, so Judge Cromwell, what I was going to ask you was, in 1978, you wrote an article on habeas corpus. Uh, I think you were working at Queens at the time. It's <laughs> Uh, and, um, and I can say, actually, that whenever a prison law case came in front of you while you were on court, counsel on both sides of the aisle would try and cite your article because they thought it was points. Um, but what I wanted to ask, because now there's two things you've done. You've been a jurist, and now you're interested in access to justice. What did you think habeas corpus could be at the time that you wrote that article in 1978? And what do you think it has become? Because part of the issue with habeas corpus today is an access to justice issue, fundamentally. Uh, when we're trying to get redress for what is happening to prisoners in the federal system, we have two options, which is a federal court system, and then we've got habeas corpus before provincial superior courts. The problem is that there are boundaries to habeas corpus. And there was a time when jurists were trying to expand those boundaries. Uh, the case of Gamble in 1988, uh, where they, did, they granted habeas corpus along the Section 24-1 charter review, seems to have been forgotten. And I struggle with this, in the sense that you want to be able to do things for your clients quickly and effectively. So you try habeas corpus, but then you find yourself bound by the writ, which doctrinally and traditionally people say the only remedy is release. What can be done um, in terms of your now interest in access to justice as well as your expansive knowledge of charter remedies uh, to expand. Where can we go with Hades for this? And did it develop the way you might have seen it in 1978? I'm on my Quick, I'll try to be a quicker answer to that. Number one, I think when we 
we were doing some of that work on Hades in the 70s, we were dealing with two realities. One was the overlap between the judicial review jurisdiction of the federal court and the habeas jurisdiction of the <coughs> provincial superior courts. And we were constantly confronted with the argument that if you wanted to do anything more than uh, review the sort of the facial uh, legality of the detention, you needed the certiorari, it was called certiorari needed habeas corpus, but that was within the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal court. So we resisted that. I think that issue went to the Supreme Court about three times. I'm not quite sure why I had to go three times. It didn't seem that complicated to me. But, you know. um, so we sorted that one out the, the, and really had a more searching ability to probe the conditions of incarceration. The other piece of it is I think we were inspired by some of the U.S. jurisprudence on the use of habeas corpus to get at conditions in prison. Um, because of the way our criminal code appeal provisions are set up and the, the ex ex rather explicit limitations of remedies other than appeals, we didn't, I, th I think, feel that we would ever get into a whole lot of conviction review stuff through habeas corpus. But we did expect that we'd be able to do quite a bit in terms of conditions of Incarceration and some of that I think has come come to pass, um, but it seems to me that a lot of litigation is still taken to the federal court by way of judicial review. Whether that's simply because it's hard to link the particular challenge to any condition of imprisonment that could be seen as a restriction on liberty, or whether that's a decision that's made for other reasons, I don't know. You could probably help us with that. But I think we hoped that habeas corpus would be an important tool for challenging conditions of incarceration in those days, and I think to some extent that has happened. Short answer to a tough question. I'm going to try to get one more in here if I could. Up here? Yes. Me? Yes, you. Okay, so I'm not going to guess the professor again, so just you. <laughs> uh, Tom Engel from Edmonton. Uh, Dr. Zinger, I have a question I want to pick up on your statement that you have the power to call a public inquiry and never have. Um, and Justice Cromwell said it's important to shine the light on what is going on in our prisons. And I'm very surprised that the correctional investigator hasn't called a public inquiry. In Edmonton, the Edmonton institution, the MAX, is a cesspool of violence and corruption. And it's there's a lot of notoriety publicly about it, and it seems to me, if, if you're going to have a public inquiry on some Sergeant Pepper in Vancouver spraying a bunch of demonstrators with pepper spray, which was a serious incident, this is way more serious, what's going on in our prisons. So how come there hasn't been a public inquiry call? Well, uh, I can tell you, uh, our office um, had the authority for for decades now, and we have yet um, to use it. That doesn't mean that we will never use it. Um, I think the um, often the uh, part of the problem, I, I, I would say, is the nature of, of being an ombudsman office. So it, it's a delicate balance in terms of, uh, uh, especially when you're a prison ombudsman, that you are dedicated uh, constantly to. Um, to oversee uh, an agency, and then you have to sort of, uh, uh, it's not like, a, for example, an auditor general that comes in and then makes a bad report and then leaves the department alone for another five years and then comes back. We're always there. And part of the ombudsman, uh, I guess one of the pillars, is to attempt to resolve matters uh, at the lowest level and informally. And we are, uh, if you want, an uh, informal avenue of redress. That was the, uh, the, the that's one of the uh, reasons for, for uh, setting up ombudsman offices. Um, and if we one day would decide that it would be appropriate, we would have to, you know, seek out all sorts of lawyers to help us to, you know, to meet the requirement. 
Uh, our office, uh, we only have two lawyers out of uh, you know, 40 employees. Uh, and that's not by accident. These were decisions that were made by my predecessors. Um, and it's the, the whole idea is that if you're trying to resolve matters um, uh, and you bring lawyers to the table, uh, then, then it becomes problematic because then uh, the, the, you know, the correctional officers will come with their union rep and their lawyers and, and then you, you won't get that informal resolution. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one for me to say, I'm not saying no, never, uh, but it, it is very unusual that we have that authority. Um, and, um, and as I say, sometimes you have to go the route of the formal system. And I will tell you, um, in my role as an executive director prior to this, this role, when I managed the office and I was in, in, in intertwined in daily cases, uh, which now is, is uh, uh, being managed by my, my new executive director, it was not a day where there was not a case that was brought to my attention where I sort of said, this would be better dealt with by a lawyer or by the formal system. Because we were basically uh, often um, resolving matters that deal with human rights violation. And I'm not sure whether every time that that's an appropriate way of dealing with it uh, informally. Um, I think eventually you know, some of those cases would be better uh, served in the long term by having a formal system with everything that a posthumous uh, formal system brings. Uh, thank you all very much. We're, we're at 7.30. I just want to say this has been a tremendously humbling and informative session for me. Until tonight, I would have been part of the professional development crowd, and my takeaway is, is that we're not going to professional development our way out of this. And Take all the judges to jail. <laughs> I think, uh, I, I, I think the biggest challenge uh, in these types of conferences is to see everybody so enthusiastic and then say what's for dinner and go on to our busy, busy lives. But I get a sense at this conference, due to the wonderful start and wonderful organizers, that there will be some tangible takeaways. And I would urge all of us to think about some tangible takeaways. I'm going to Vancouver in the morning, unfortunately, but over the weekend, uh, think of some tangible takeaways because uh, it's not enough to be inspired for a few hours. I think we've got to turn it into action. So thank you all very much. I'm honored to be here.